Hi, this is Dr. Kerry Gill, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. Today, I have a good friend with me today, Dr. Nikki Despeditis. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry, and it was his children's need for glasses that got him so interested in this topic of myopia. He's the lead author of this book, A Parent's Guide to Raising Children with Healthy Vision. And he also has done a great TED Talk. If you get a chance, you got to go see his TED Talk. I just love it. It's so passionate and so moving. A childhood disease worth preventing. So, Nikki, thanks for being a guest with me today. And to explain to the public a little bit what we do as optometrists. And I know you saw our film, Open Your Eyes. Thank you for watching it. You're welcome, Kerry, and thank you for inviting me. Actually, I, I watched it in preparation for this talk last night. I have to tell you, it really affected me, and, and I mean this with all due seriousness. I saw it before I went to bed, and I slept uneasy because I knew the facts as an optometrist, but seeing it on the big screen convinced me not even myself are doing enough in my own family to protect their eyes, but also to protect their health. It really moved me. So tell me, how did you get involved in being interested in myopia? Tell me the backstory. Yeah, it really was purely selfish. I've been practicing for 30 years. And about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, my own children at the time were in second grade, started to need glasses for myopia, which means they were nearsighted. Nearsighted means up close, they saw things clearly without glasses but at a distance they couldn't see. And this was troubling because my wife and I did not wear glasses for nearsightedness until we were in college. And at that time I just said, hmm, it was kind of like, all right, I prescribed glasses when they were in second grade. And then something disturbing happened. Their eyesight started to get worse, Carrie. You know, in third grade, I increased their prescription a little bit. And when my oldest son was in fourth grade, he was 2200, which that means when he looked at the eye chart, one of the biggest letters that I have, he couldn't see. So I got involved with myopia or nearsightedness purely out of selfish reasons. It's when my kids started suffering from it is when I decided to focus my practice on it. It seems, and we know that the incidence of myopia is increasing. What do you think the reasons are for that? You know, I know what it is. And I, I bet you every listener, viewer out there knows what it is. Our kids are on their screens too much. You know, when I mention this to parents, they go, and you do it all the time. They go, aha, I knew it. You know, it's kind of like you're on this screen all the time. And then a little war occurs in my exam room where the child says, no, I'm not. You're on your phone and the parents and everybody's screaming at one another. What research has shown is that our children are spending too much time indoors. And the daylight seems to inoculate our kids from becoming nearsighted. The problem is, even in rural areas, Children prefer to stay inside on their Chromebook, on their you know, uh, iPad, on their cell phone, rather than go play outside. So there's a visual, a physical ramification to kids always being on screens. And that's why I think this myopia epidemic is progressing. Why do you think being outside decreases the incidence of myopia? You know, the truth is nobody knows, but there's a lot of good theories. First of all, it makes sense that the child is looking far away instead of on their phone, literally inches from their nose. That's one thing. Number two is daylight seems to have a chemical reaction in the back of the brain, back of the eye rather, that signals the eye not to elongate. When the eye elongates, just micrometers, literally the thickness of this paper, if the eye elongates just the thickness of this paper, the child's prescription would have worsened. And then as doctors, eye doctors, we prescribe stronger glasses to account for this increase in axial length, it's called, or eye length. And I think the daylight has some type of chemical, photochemical reaction to the back of the eye. Listen, we all know this. We weren't born to stay indoors sitting on our butts all day, we're made to go outside in, the, in nature. 
That, I mean, that was a big part of your documentary is it shouldn't be this casual thing. I should go outside. I love that line. It's that should be an integral part of our lives as being outside. And the opposite is true. There's so many kids that they're looking at their tablets all day. They're looking at the computer all day. They used to go outside and play sports and, and, you know, interact with other people, other kids. Talk about the psychological aspect of myopia. Yeah, I truly believe that what we see in the exam room, the visual myopia, is a physical manifestation of a much bigger problem. And I call that social myopia. Every parent knows the more time our children spend on their phone or tablet, the less time they are looking at us when we're speaking to them. It's eye contact has become a rarity at times. And, and this is important, Carrie, in that most of our children become obsessed with screens during adolescence. That's a period in their maturation where they're growing at a very high rate, where these social skills should be refined. So when we play sports or just jump rope or whatever tag, which we don't see as much anymore, you were developing social skits. Who were, the, who were the bullies? Who were the good kids? How did you negotiate outside? You know, how did you judge by looking at patients or people in the eyes, rather? Our children, my children, didn't develop those skills as fully as they could have because they communicate with one another on a screen. So not only does it seem to cause the myopia, it causes this social awkwardness where they don't feel comfortable looking at one another in the eye. And as you know, in life, one of the most important skills we can learn, more than academics, I would say, is how to speak to someone face to face, whether you go for a college interview, a job interview, or a social interaction. It's how do we look at one another and judge one another when we're socially interacting in person? How do you think, as optometrists, we could help change the way? Uh, parents interact with their children to help them be, to get them outside, to play outside with other yeah. children? I have to tell you, I think it's in the exam room. It seems to me, my patients, my pediatric patients, my adolescent patients, listen to me more than my own kids. Maybe it's the white coat. Maybe it's the exam room. And parents will say, he doesn't listen to me, Dr. D., you tell him, and I speak to the child as an adult, and I, I ask the parent not to scold the child on the way home from the exam. I think as health providers, we have to spend one minute to explain to the child, listen, do you think being on your Chromebook, on your cell phone, is good or bad for your eyes? And almost unanimously, even a five-year-old says, bad. And I Tell them, listen, I am going to ask your parents. I give your parents permission to give you guidelines that after school, when your homework is done, don't decompress by going on a screen. Limit your entertainment after school to about a half an hour, one hour maximum. And children get uneasy, but the doctor ordered it. So I think as optometrists, it's it's imperative that we take one minute out of our exam to educate not only the parent, but the child and give the parent permission to set guidelines for their children. So we become the bad guys in a way. So parents can say, hey, Dr. Gelb said, this is bad for your eyes. Get off the iPad and go outside. So the parent and the child now are not bumping heads. It's like the parent is following the doctor's orders. What's so troubling to me is that many schools only look at iPads. Yeah, that's right. Very troubling. And there's a New York Times article a few years ago that says in California, where the tech capital of the world is, right, near San Francisco, the Bay Area, they were giving out Chromebooks or iPads, and parents revolted. And they got them out of the higher income school systems and actually gave them to lower income school systems, which actually hurt the children. So we used to associate electronics with advanced education. Parents are realizing very quickly, these computers are hurting my children, they're not helping them. 
they had a better education, looking at books, doing their homework, studying for their assignments, and then going knocking on the door. Remember you used to do that? You used to knock on your friend's door. Hey, can Nick come out and play? And sometimes my mother would chase you away and say, get out of here. And other times say, come on in. Our kids don't do that. They right. text one another, you know? And, and that's, to me, very hurtful and harmful to the kids. You know, when we're outside, this, the light from the sun is a mix of all different uh, wavelengths. We have blue, we have infrared, we have UVA, we have UVB. When we're looking at the screen, it's mostly blue. That's and right. it's not being balanced by the healthy red. If you could talk about some of the side effects of blue light by itself. Yeah, blue light, there's a, a lot of controversy on whether this blue light truly is affecting us. But the one thing I've read unanimously, blue light, all these blue lights, like you said, fluorescent lights, TV, screens, Chromebooks, and especially the cell phone, is it affects the melatonin in our brain. Melatonin is a type of hormone that allows us to sleep. And blue light seems to affect the amount of melatonin that's secreted in the brain, up to 50%, I've read. And therefore, we don't sleep as well. We don't rest as well. That's one fact that I've been reading about on blue light. But what parents are asking me, can I get my children blue light glasses? They're missing the point. Yeah, blue light glasses, these blue blocking glasses, may filter the amount of blue light. But your child's still sitting stationary, looking at a TV, literally a foot or two away from their nose. It's not resolving the main problem, which is getting your child to interact face to face. I mean, I agree. I think as doctors, we need to talk to our, the kids that we come in, as, that come in as patients and encourage them to play sports or do something outside. I tell all my parents and that when they come in with their children, they got to get their kids outside at least an hour a day. I don't care if it's cold out, they got to get them outside, whether it's kicking a ball or running around the block or walking or doing something because right. their life is indoors and right. people don't realize what, what's, how it's really changing that we're going to have a whole society of people that don't know how to speak to each other. And we really don't know what this blue light is going to do with people. And, you know, you know, is there, is the radiation, is it a problem? Is the blue light a problem? Is there going to be an increase in other chronic diseases just by sitting in blue light? There are doctors out there that feel that this light could actually, and not being out in the sun will contribute to a lot of chronic disease and all the EMFs that are associated with it. Yeah. You know, the, the statistic that's out there is by the year 2050, just 30 years from now, half the world will suffer from myopia or nearsightedness. But how about if you're right? How about if half the world will be obese, let's say, by that time, which, or have diabetes? It's possible. The Open Eyes documentary really opened my eyes. It's embarrassing to say that, yeah, we've contributed to this with our lifestyle. I am telling you, Carrie, and I think you'll agree with me, what we're seeing in our exam room with myopia is just a physical symptom of a much bigger problem. Our kids are not going out there. So what I tell parents is, listen, your child may not like sports, like you in the documentary, so you play baseball. But some kids like myself, I don't like the competitive sports. I say, you know, have them join the track team or the, the field team at school, or have them find a friend. There are friends that like to go outside. And a lot of times the kids were saying to me, Dr. D, it's too cold, it's too hot. It's, uh, uh, you know, I may get uh, kidnapped, you know, I said, and I said, yeah, those are true. But they've always been the case. And your mom and dad and I always went outside. Find friends that enjoy being outside because when you tell parents to spend an hour a day outdoors, do they sometimes look at you like you have two heads? Right, they, they don't, like, don't know from outdoors. That's right. It's like I work, and it's a true concern. I work. Uh, the school, you know, gets dark at 4.30. You have to make it a priority, unfortunately. When we were younger, the priority was we get our homework done and run outside. Now it's get our homework done. And let me check out what's going on Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, or just watch TV. It's just not healthy. 
And as the eye elongates, it's associated with other types of ocular disease. If you could explain that. That's right. So like I said, it only has to elongate just micrometers we're talking about, less than a thickness of a hair, which exponentially exposes our children to eye diseases. For example, glaucoma. We hear about it a lot, but it, it's the silent cause of blindness. Glaucoma is where the eye fills up with water and the drainage system doesn't work in the eye. And slowly, painlessly, a child as they grow into adult can lose their vision. A very another common side effect of high degrees of myopia is a retinal detachment. And you and I, unfortunately, have diagnosed several patients with this. But here's a disturbing fact, and I really want to ask you, I'm starting to see retinal disease in, in children, in teens. Have you seen that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I never used to see it 20, 30 years ago. No. And now I'm catching retinal tears where the retina starts to thin out. It's like taking a sheet and pulling on that sheet just a little bit. And if the sheet starts to age, it rips easily. That's a retinal tear. I'm starting to see that in children who require laser surgery or worse to kind of seal off the retina so it won't tear any further. These are all complications of high degrees of myopia. And, and um, macular degeneration and cataracts. Right. I yeah. mean, those are Macular degeneration, we're living longer. Macular degeneration is a degeneration of a part of the eye that we call the macula. And you and I used to associate this with older age, so to speak. And the older I get, the higher the age used to go up. <laughs> but now we're noticing it. You and I are noticing it in younger people, younger than we are. And that's disturbing because you know that something is causing this change. It could be our diet. It could be the amount of time we spend outside. But I don't want to wait another 20, 30 years to really find out if going outside helped our body, our system, our, our, our overall health, not just our eyes. Now, explain astigmatism and farsight in it, and farsightness. Then we're going to go into the prevention and what we could do to prevent myopia. Yeah. This is a great question because parents, even doctors get mixed up sometimes. What is farsighted nearsightedness? Nearsighted, uh, nearsightedness means I can see good at near. I need glasses to see far away. Farsightedness is what many of us get after 40 years old. We see good far away, but things close up are blurry. That's why you see some people stretch their hands out like this to see their phone, for example, or use their phone to light up a menu. Those people are farsighted. They see better far away. Astigmatism means the eye is not totally round. So they kind of have a little bit of farsightedness, a little nearsight is mixed in. So they see, but they see in a distorted fashion. So some with, someone with astigmatism would mix up maybe a number eight with a zero, or not sure if the B is an O, because the astigmatism distorts what they're looking at. Another common sign of astigmatism is when they're driving at night and they see glare. That's another symptom of astigmatism. So let's talk about when we start to see myopia develop in children. What are things that we could do to prevent myopia? Yeah, the first thing you should do, in my opinion, is before your child starts school, see an optometrist and get a thorough eye exam. Because sometimes the school screening or even the pediatrician screening is just checking for nearsightedness or maybe astigmatism, but not farsightedness and not how the two eyes work together as a team. So the first step is get an eye exam. If you get it early enough and we catch your child just starting, to develop nearsightedness, we change their environment. A lot of times they'll say, does your son or daughter play on an iPad? They'll say, oh my God, Dr. D, he's always on it. He's going like this, he knows to swipe the, uh, the pad. I can't get him off it, he's watching YouTube. That's when, as healthcare providers, it's important to help the parents by saying, listen, I would limit that iPad use to the weekends. I wouldn't bring the iPad to bed with them. I wouldn't have them look at their iPad the first thing they walk in wake up and get the child outside, get the whole family outside. 
it's almost a relief for parents to say, you know what, leaving my phone at home will help my children, I'll do it. So that's the first step. The second step is, unfortunately, if the child's myopia progresses, we can do other things than just prescribe eyeglasses. They are now working on eye drops that don't have FDA approval, but are being prescribed that help slow down or stop the progression of a child's eye deteriorating. This is a drop called atropine that a pharmacist compounds, which means they dilute it in a very sterile environment and they send it to the patient's home and the parent or the child instills one drop a night. And that seems to help slow down or prevent the eyesight from deteriorating. Then you go back, you see your optometrist in a month to three months. They evaluate if the drop is being effective. If it's not, they increase the dosage sometimes. Also, they check for side effects because every parent knows any medication, and I'll include food in that, in that equation, any medication affects our child. So as healthcare providers, we actually check to see if there are any side effects, like are the pupils dilating? Is the child having trouble focusing? Do they feel a little bit kind of like down or, you know, kind of like uh, mopey? So we check for that as well. So those are eye drops is one of the first line of defenses that we help to prevent the eyes from getting worse. And how effective are these eye drops? Really effective. They're very effective. They can slow down progression up to 50%. So these drops are very powerful, but I want to stipulate it. It is a drug. It's a powerful drug because as you will attest to it, the pharmacist dilutes this medication almost a hundred times. It's almost like they're putting 99 drops of sterile saline and one drop of this drug called atropine, which is one of the drops we use to dilate the pupils. It's been around a long time, but it's a drug nonetheless. And you need to visit a doctor who not only just prescribes it, but monitors your child to see if the drop is working and if there are any side effects. I can't overemphasize that enough. What kind of tests do you do to see if the child and the drug is working to see if their myopia is progressing? Like you, I have a lot of computer technology. And one of the tests I do is that we sit the child in front of this computer and the child looks at a picture. In our, in our computer, it's a farm. And without the child saying anything, this computer lets me know what the child's prescription is within a high degree of accuracy. So every three months, we call that an objective measurement, meaning the child doesn't say better one, better two. They just look at this farmhouse and literally with this, within a second, we determine, was this measurement different from three months ago? So that's one measurement. The second measurement we do is in the exam room, we have the data from the previous exam and we flash an eye chart and we measure the child's prescription. We call that subjective because we do need the child's feedback on it. So we do an objective measurement and a subjective measurement. And then we compare it from the previous three months or so. If the prescription's stable and we don't view any side effects, we continue the drop until the child is ready for something that I feel is a better option than just eye drops because the fact of the matter is these drops aren't FDA approved for this method. They're FDA approved to dilate pupils, but they're not FDA approved to use on a consistent basis yet. So we just use that in our office as a stopgap until we could do something that maybe optically corrects the child's eyes because the drops don't correct the child's vision. They just stop it from getting worse. And you test for the length of the eye? I do problem? not. I do not. I'll tell you why. We don't know what it means. What happens is we talked about the eye growing this way. The eye can also grow this way uh, vertically, not only horizontally. And there's a lot of noise in the system. That is going to be the standard of care in the future. But what I have found, no matter how many times I've measured, that this doesn't give me a repeatable result. And I'm maybe an outlier 
but that's what we, we don't do that measurement in our office. The other reason I don't do it, to be honest with you, everything becomes about that measurement of length. And it's not the only thing that's going on here. You and I have said, parents are concerned about their kids' myopia. They really want to talk about the environment the child is, is, is in, including what they eat. Are they eating a balanced diet? It's not that bad to come see me every three months. So I can reiterate, get off your phone, get outside. How's your diet looking? And a lot of times parents are, it's okay. Parents say, you know what? It's been pretty crappy. And I'm a parent too. You know, we've, we've fed our kids pizza, chicken nuggets, like all of us. But it's nice to hear from a health provider, listen, it's time to get on the bicycle. Let's put some good fats in our diets. This was open eyes. It just reminded me also, you know, you have some nuts, some avocado, some fish once a week. You know, what does your diet look at? Are you putting greens in the, in the food? That kind of thing. That's what it allows me to focus on. When it just becomes about the numbers, carry, everybody gets obsessed, including the eye doctor with the numbers, and they forget about the child that's sitting in the chair. I've seen it all too often. Lauren Cordain, who wrote The Paleo Diet, he was actually in optometry school for a semester or so before he decided to become a researcher. He has a theory about how a high carbohydrate, a high sugar diet, bad carbohydrates, because it causes things to, it's, it's anabolic, it causes things to grow, it could be a cause of myopia. And I think that makes a lot of sense to me. I think it's all interconnected. If there's one thing I got from your documentary and the many that I view, I'm a student of this. Nobody has the answer. If someone says, I have the answer, there's no, there's, there's multi variables causing this, but I don't doubt all the sugars are processed carbohydrates. We all put in our diet, I'm just as guilty, I'm not here to preach, is contributing to a multitude of health problems, including myopia. I don't doubt it. Absolutely. So let's talk about some other treatments. Let's talk about soft lenses before we get into orthokeratology. Sure. What we do in our office, we fit contact lenses to slow down the progression of myopia. Not every parent's interested in it. Every parent is different and I always respect the parents fully. When a parent is concerned, oftentimes they themselves have high myopia and the child is not able to put in a contact lens or ready mentally, or the parents, may, the family may not be ready. We put them on this diluted atropine drop and watch them very carefully. After a year or so, the child, the family becomes more comfortable with us and we talk about now corrective measures like soft, multifocal contact lenses that can slow down the progression of myopia and in addition allow the child to see because the child still has to wear glasses when they're taking the drops. With a visual correction like soft contacts, they have to put in the contact, the contact allows them to see, it corrects their nearsightedness, but there's a power, we call it multifocal or dual focus, that also slows down the eyesight from getting worse. And that's our goal in our office, is we not only want to slow it down, we want to improve the child's quality of life by getting rid of the glasses. So we fit soft multifocal lenses, and we do this very specific. A lot of parents ask me, which is the best contact lens? And the best contact lens varies from child to child. You know this. I, I've, I've seen your office. You have so many contact lenses, soft contacts, and parents, so they ask you, which is the best one? Right, of course. And you would explain to them, listen, they're all different materials, they're all different parameters. What we have found is that there's not one soft contact lens that's multifocal that slows down the progression of myopia the best for this child. Every child's different. So we'll start with one contact lens, that fits the child well, that lets them see. Because you have to remember, when you're eight, nine, 10 years old, sometimes younger, you're not motivated to put a contact lens in. Your parents may be motivated to slow down your eye progression because they don't want you to have those eye diseases like macular degeneration, things like that. We want to reduce the risk of those. But a child, touch my eye, put something in it. One more thing I have to do at night in addition to wash my face, no way. So what we first do, is gently and very slowly get the child to see out of a contact lens. And that's very rewarding because the teacher says, hey, Nick, where's your glasses? I wear contact lenses. And then the students, you get some attention there. Plus you can see, 
there's a beauty to see without glasses. You have peripheral vision. And then we slowly integrate the multifocal or dual part of the lens, the second part of the lens that helps slow down the progression of the myopia. So we do this very gradually over a year period. It's not like the soft contact you buy at the mall and here's your contact lens and you go on your way. The doctor actually fits it, has you come back or she has you come back, sees how it's working and then adjusts accordingly. A lot of parents ask, how does this contact lens work? If you could explain how it works, how we think it works and the concept of peripheral defocus. That's, that's a very good question. You know, the way we think it works is the way glasses work is that, or contacts, it allows the image of what you're looking at to fall in the retina. This paper is symbolizing the retina. So this is a ray of light. Let's say you're looking at TV, it falls here, it's clear. If the ray of light falls short because your eye has elongated, we now call this nearsightedness. So typically the way we correct this if with a regular contact lens or eyeglasses, we put the image back on the retina. But on the posterior, the back part of the retina, what doctors have found, that allows us to see clearly centrally, but the periphery of the retina is not in focus. And that's what you call peripheral defocus. So if this is the shape of my eye, here it's clear, but the image is blurry in the back of the eye. So if you could visualize this, Carrie, the child sees clearly with a regular pair of glasses or contacts because it falls on the retina, but the periphery, the, the outer perimeter of the eye sees blurry because the image is flat like this. What a dual focus or multifocal contact lens does, it creates a curved correction to help stop the eyes from elongating because what scientists believe today is that this Peripheral defocus on the sides is what's initiating the eye to elongate. And as we said, it doesn't take a lot. A micrometer, a micrometer, less than a, a, a millimeter of growth actually changes the prescription substantially. And that exposes our children to problems possibly later in life. Fantastic. That's a fantastic explanation. Probably the best I've ever heard. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to me about ortho-K. Patients are starting to learn about ortho-keratology, uh, the parents that don't know what it is, and how effective, first, are the soft lenses, how effective, what is ortho-K, and how effective are they? Yeah, let me tell you, ortho-K is a description. It's called ortho-keratology. There's many terms to it, but it's OK lens, or ortho-K for short, is a specific type of contact lens that's different than any other one because it has no prescription. The soft contact lenses and glasses actually have a power to put the focus of light onto the retina. An ortho-K lens is unusual because there's no corrective power in the contact lens. The way it works is it changes the shape of the child's eye as they sleep. In other words, it molds, it shapes the child's cornea, the very front of the eye as they sleep. So let me bring you back to about 1999, 1998, about 22 years ago or so as we speak. My children become nearsighted. Orthokeratology is not FDA approved yet. It's FDA, it was FDA approved in 2002 by a company called Paragon Vision Sciences. So it was about two or three years prior to being approved. And doctors were talking amongst one another that they've been fitting children with ortho-K lenses. And it's been anecdotally or hearsay stopping the eyes from getting worse. I'm watching my kids get worse every year. I'm not linking outdoor play. I'm not a scientist. I'm a clinician. I'm an eye doctor. I kind of knew them being on the computers all day was not a good thing. But I didn't link it yet, Kerry. I just saw them getting worse every year. So when my child, my oldest son was 10 years old, I fit him with this orthokeratology contact lens. And I swear to you, today he is 30 years old, 31. He still wears it. So orthokeratology is a technology that we design a contact lens that has no prescription, that gently and safely 
reshapes the child's eye while they sleep, the very surface of the eye. So when the child takes off the lens in the morning, they see clearly because at night, their eye was reshaped, kind of like a retainer that our child wears after they get braces. And they put this lens in every night to maintain that shape. So the first advantage of orthokeratology is the child can go eyeglass, contact lens free the entire day. Whether they go to school, play sports or do homework, they don't require glasses. So that's one very important advantage of the ortho-K technology. The second important factor is with an ortho-K lens, the design is doctor driven. Since it's FDA approval, Paragon, this company Paragon approved it in 2002. Another company called Bausch & Lohm approved it in 2004. So we're talking a 15 year old technology. Doctors can actually design a lens to create a shape where it's in focus here and at least mirrors the shape of the periphery, which seems to signal to the eye, there's no need to elongate. There's no need to become more myopic or more nearsighted or at least slow it down. So there's two distinct advantages and that's my specialty is it allows the children to see without glasses and contacts during the day, builds their self-esteem. My kids don't even remember wearing glasses, but it also has slowed down the progression of their myopia as they got older, which again reduces their risk of eye diseases later in life. How many Christmas presents do you get for doing this ortho K? Because the parents are so happy and the children are so happy that get ortho K. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. And, and as a side, you know, we talk about patients a lot as doctors, and, and you were my one of my instructors, Carrie, over 30 years ago. We do this for financial reward, we do it for professional reward. But when a parent does thank me and gives me a card, I wish I had them here. I have it right here from Christmas time. I save them, whether it's a box of cookies. Parents never thank me for fitting their children with glasses. Almost got mad at me at times. I don't know if you know this. They'll go, again? Well, I didn't do it. You know, I'm just correcting their eyes. But with orthokeratology, they're actually saying, my child is a better adult because they didn't wear glasses. Their self-esteem is better. Their eye health is better. There's no doubt, and there's studies on this. Our children's self-esteem improves when they're not behind a pair of glasses. It seems the studies have brought this out, but we see this. They're, they're really not this behind this layer. They're open. They're able to enjoy everyday life and see clearly. It's, it's amazing how we could change lives with orthokeratology and what it does for the family, not only for the children, but it, what it does for the parents and how the parents feel. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when you get notes like this, where it's handwritten, literally heartfelt. It's not, they're not wishing us a happy new year or a happy holiday. They're saying thank you because you did something that many doctors did not or could not. You took the time to explain to me that my child has options other than stronger and stronger glasses every year. Then you were patient with me and my child and let us decide as a family what's best for my child. And there's one more thing. Oftentimes, I'm sure you hear this, you're the only doctor, not I doctor, that took the time to talk to our family about food, about healthy food, about going outside and playing, about how important eye contact is, about not letting my child sleep with their phone. Parents knew it couldn't be good for them, but they just needed an authority to say, no, it's actually not. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you've seen the studies where there may be cognitive effects of our children being on, on, on screens, meaning actual anatomical brain changes to children if they spend too much time on screens. This data is being collected as we speak. Yes, it decreases IQ points. I, I don't know if you've heard about the ABCD study. You got to look it up. The Adolescent Brain Cognitive uh, Development Study. Fantastic. They're collecting data 
on 10 and 11 year old children doing actual scans and watching them over the next 10 or 20 years to see what affects the, the maturation of their brain, their physical brain. After the first year or two, they seem to suspect that screen time actually affects the anatomy of their brain. Unbelievable. How, how effective are the soft lenses and the orthokeratology lenses, and how are they for sports? Two separate questions. I think from all the data I've read is the eye drops that I spoke about, the diluted atropine eye drops, the soft multifocal contact lenses and orthokeratology seem to slow down myopia about the same. From data I've read, they slow it down by 40 to 50%, depending on the study. And it also depends on the doctor doing it, how much time the doctor's spending to really fine tune the prescription. So if your child is every year doubling in prescription, this in theory can cut it down to half. And oftentimes I see a stability. So my children, let's talk about my children. My one son was 10 years old when he started. That young man is 31 today. His prescription has barely changed over 20 years. One diopter, which is one point over 20 years, it's nothing. I've seen children change one point every year. My younger son, he started wearing these Ortho-K contact lenses in second grade. It wasn't easy. He was a kid. He was in second grade. He was seven, seven and a half years old. He is now in medical school. He is 28 years old. His degree has not changed. It is a miracle to me, even as a clinician, to sit here in front of you to say, from literally seven years old to 27, 28, his degree has stayed the same. Sports? I, sports is just a general part of overall life. My children don't even remember wearing glasses. And that's what precipitated me to do the TED Talk because parents have heard about it. And I've written not one, but two books trying to educate parents. But to this day, I'm sure you've hear, heard this. How come I've never heard of it before? How come other doctors don't do that? But that's changing, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. I have found the same thing with Ortho K. I have kids that I have fit back from 2003. Now they're in medical school. Now they've gone on to PhDs. Now they've gone for other jobs and great jobs. And their prescription is basically stable. And, you know, I think it's better than what the studies show. I think so. But we've been doing it a long time. Doesn't it give you great gratification? Notice what you said. I found the same thing. The majority of my kids who participate in orthokeratology contact lenses, they're high achievers. Almost 99% go to college. That's a given. But they also go to grad school because parents ask me, when can they stop wearing the ortho K lens? And oftentimes I say it's until the child doesn't want to wear them. But children are going to uh, graduate school, PhD, MD, MBAs, medical school, and we keep having them wear it until they don't want to. So one of my sons, the 28-year-old, he stopped a year or so ago. He's very good. He's very happy. He's doing night rounds. He didn't want to wear them anymore. And my other son's 31, who's in real estate. He wears them. He loves them. Just loves them. So there's so, no age limit. So I want to thank Dr. Nikki for spending time with us. If you could give us three or four summary points, and, uh, and then if you could explain how people could get in touch with you, if they want to learn more about you, if they want to get a copy of your wonderful book, uh, Dr. Nikki practices in Hamilton, New Jersey. In Hamilton, oh, I lost you for some reason. Oh, no. Can you see me? Yeah, I see you clearly. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, Dr. Dr. Nikki Despedidas practices in Hamilton, New Jersey. And uh, tell us how we could, how we could find you. A pa pa parents, patients want to find you. People that want to become patients, they want to get your book. And also give us three or four summary points. Okay, let me give you the summary points first. I think we all now have permission after listening to this, if you've sat through this, to tell your children and yourselves that screen time has specific physical side effects. We call that myopia in the eye field, but we venture to say there's probably a lot more than that. So we give you permission to put down your phone, certainly take your phone away from your children. Don't let them sleep with it. Don't let them eat with it. 
and don't even let them do their homework on it because a lot of times our children feel they're good multitaskers. They'll do their homework, then they'll check maybe a uh, text that's come in, then they'll go back on. So just take the phone away. Proximity matters. So rule number one is get your children to limit their screen time. Number two, getting our kids out in nature is extremely important to their overall health. Listen, as a parent, when I was younger, I just wanted my kids to be a doctor, lawyer, Indian chief. But the older we get, we just want our kids to be healthy and happy, God willing. That's it. And getting them outside will help achieve that. And the third lesson to take away is you don't have to sit idly by if your child is progressing in myopia. Find an optometrist that listens to you and let them offer you the best choices for you and your family. So those are the takeaways. As far as my book, it's on Amazon, A Parent's Guide to Raising Children with Healthy Vision. And through my uh, TED Talk, A Childhood Disease Worth Preventing, it's a 10 minute talk. I've put a lot of effort in trying to get my parents through, um, uh, my message through to parents on that talk. I recommend it. Well, thank you for spending time with us. You're a wealth of information and you're a good friend. I thank you.